May only God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Have you been led to believe that the God of the Old Testament is an angry God? Do you believe in a God who loves you with unbounding joy? As Christians, we spend a lot of time poring over the New Testament. We are immersed in the stories of Jesus' life, what we know and what we presume to know. We follow the teachings of Paul in the epistles, and a few other authors of the New Testament shed light on the life and teachings of Jesus in the rest of the New Testament. It's important to know that all of these men were well-versed in what we call the Old Testament, what is more aptly named the Hebrew Bible. This was their Bible, the Torah, the Tanakh. These were their holy scriptures. Even calling it the Old Testament puts it in an inferior position. Jesus and his early followers were Jews. There was no New Testament, and they did not think of their God as an angry God. He was their loving God. Our first reading from Genesis today is filled with the image of God as a loving God. Some of the most loving poetry is right there. Look toward heaven, God says to Abram, and count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your descendants be. God makes a covenant, a promise with Abram that he does not break. Later, Abram is renamed Abraham, which means father of many nations. Now look at today's psalm, a love song from the Hebrew Bible. King David is talking about his trust and faith in God's love. He speaks directly to his belief that God will keep him safe. He petitions God's mercy for himself. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus reveals what some call the feminine side of God's love. I simply see it as a loving example of God. The lovely imagery of Jesus' desire to gather children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing. My middle son, Max, has become a farmer. Together with his fiancée, Sarah, they live and work on a farm in central New York. There, they raise cattle, pigs, ducks, and chickens. Just yesterday, he was telling me that they've had to bring the chickens, 24 of them, into the basement of the farmhouse because the cold was so deep and their coop is not heated. The image of my son gathering the flock to protect them is not lost on me. How does all this love relate to our Lenten journey? Our collect, <coughs> excuse me, our collect this Sunday, the second Sunday in Lent, says it right there. God, whose glory is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray. So I started my Lenten journey this year with a decision to give something up, but it hasn't gone so well for me. I've slipped a bit. I have a friend who asked me just on Friday for advice about what to give up. The important thing to note is that it's not really important to God what you give up or what you take on. It's the heart with which you do it. 
The goal is to turn your heart toward God. If we slip, God still loves us. God has always loved us. God has loved us since before we were born. If we slip, we turn with a penitent heart and faith towards God. Then we can hold fast to God's unchangeable truth, Jesus Christ. God does not desire punishment for our wrongdoings. God desires that we learn from the things we've done and deeply desires that we will grow, to strive to be more Christ-like. This is one of the reasons I'm involved in prison ministry. I get to see the power of God's love and the gift of its change. I believe that when we've made a mistake, whether it's a relatively small one or a wildly tremendous one, God loves us. His love remains the same for us. God's desire for a deep relationship is unchanged. Sure, our sins must grieve God, but the love is unchanged. It is my belief that only through love and learning do people change. The opportunity to have an education in prison changes an ex-convict's rate of return, known as recidivism. It changes it to basically nothing. Simply put, a man or a woman with a degree in higher education, once released, does not return to prison. Instead, when treated with respect and an opportunity to learn another way to be, they change and return to society with a deep desire for a new life. I was talking with Sean Pika, the executive director of Hudson Link for Higher Education in prison the other day. He is on a mission to bring this higher education to as many prisons and incarcerated people as possible. This program is changing so many lives. As these people become educated and their lives are changed, the communities they return to are changed also. Even when these men and women haven't been released to their communities yet, it creates change. When the child, brother, or sister of an incarcerated person sees the value of the education their loved one receives, it raises them up too. What a model for returning with a penitent heart to a God whose glory it is always to have mercy. As part of our Lenten program, next week, you are invited to clean out your closets and donate professional clothes that might be worn for job searching by the ex-convicts in the Coming Home program. Participating in these Lenten outreach programs is a great Lenten activity. And perhaps you don't give up anything specifically for Lent. That's okay. However, if you want to start today, that's okay too. Our God is a God of new beginnings. My belief is that it doesn't matter what you give up or take on for Lent, as long as you use this time to listen for the heartbeat of God in your life and look for the images of our loving God around you. I ask you to think about this. How does it change you? Sure, Lenten practices can help you pay more attention, and certainly you will grow as a result of a great Lenten fast, but God won't punish you either way. God wants a relationship with you based on love. Images. 
As Sean Pika sat in my office talking to me, I saw the image of the mother hen spreading her wings. As I spoke to my son on the phone, I saw the image of him carrying his chicks to warmth and safety. These are images of God's enduring, unending, abiding love for us. Amen.